Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me for an author's afternoon in the locker room. Today, Wednesday, April 20th, I'm Alan Locker. Three talented writers are here today to tell us about their new books and what inspired them to write them. After nearly 30 years as both a writer and ASL interpreter, Blair Fell reached a lifetime goal of publishing his first novel, The Sign for Home. The book released earlier this month tells the story of Arlo Dilly and his pursuit of life's joys as a deaf-blind Jehovah's Witness under the strict watch of his controlling uncle. The Sign for Home was selected as both an Indies Introduced 2022 and Indie Next book by the American Booksellers Association. It's been called a must-read by BuzzFeed News and riveting by the Los Angeles Times. The novel, in draft form, received the prestigious Doris Lippmann Prize from, for fiction from the City College of New York, where Blair received his MFA in 2020. Blair is currently working on a second novel about AIDS-era Fire Island, which also received City College's top fiction prize. He is the only person to have ever won the prize twice. Before switching to fiction late in life, he wrote plays and some television, including one award-winning episode of Queer as Folk and California Public Television's award-winning California Connected. His plays include the glad-nominated Naked Will, the cult hilt Burning Habits, and the tragic and horrible life of the singing nun. His personal essays have also appeared in print and on the web in places such as the Huffington Post, Out Magazine, the New York Daily News, to name just a few. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Blair Fell. Hey, Blair. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you, Alan. You too. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. <laughs> what? For yeah, being no. here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's right. So t who or what influenced you on becoming a writer? Um, Really, it's kind of, uh, I never thought about being a novelist. That was just something I, I I loved in other people. I've always loved the form, but I never thought it's something that I could do. Um, I didn't really grow up wanting to be a writer. I, I had been an actor to begin with. And then um, when I was in college, I fell in love with my best friend and he was a writer. And mm. so, and also that led me to going to a deaf college because I had a broken heart over this straight dude who was a writer, went to Gallaudet, this deaf college, it's the only private liberal arts co college for the deaf in the world. The only liberal arts college for the deaf in the world, actually. And I learned sign language. And time went on, and I worked as an actor, and I worked in for an elected official. And then I finally decided I would be a writer myself, since I wasn't finding a lover who was a writer. So I decided to do it. And well, I started that, writing. So what, mm -hmm. what prompted you to go to that college? Just from oh, the breakup? It, yeah, it wasn't a breakup. It was, I had a broken heart. Uh, this girl that was into me was the one that introduced sign language to th this best friend and I. And so I wanted to go study sign language with him because he was going. And then those two got together and I had a broken heart. And so I dropped out of Catholic University and I switched to Gallaudet, the deaf college. And uh, stayed there for a semester before I transferred again. But before there, I had learned sign language, and then all my classes were taught by uh, either deaf people or people using sign language. Um, and so my skills improved. But then I didn't really uh, interpret for about 10 years after that until I became a writer. And then in a parallel form, I, I started interpreting and writing at the same time. Incredible. So there's a couple things I want to get to, but you, you mentioned for fans of the locker room, you mentioned that you studied under Jimmy Bohr, who is one of the casting directors from As the World Turns, Guiding Light, Another World, I believe. Um, what was it like taking classes from Jimmy? Well, it's hard to remember. I mean, you know, <laughs> when, you're, when you're a young actor and you're taking with someone that's actually in the business, you know, all you're thinking about is, am I going to become a star? Because I know this guy that's a casting director on The Guiding Light. And uh, that's all I really remember. I don't remember what scenes I did. I mean, this was a long time ago, a long yeah, time ago. Probably the early 80s, I would say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What would have been the... It would have been the mid-80s. Mid I, I took it like probably around like 86. 
that I, I studied with him. But it was when uh, the Roundabout Theater was on Union Square, and, and Union Square was just a place heroin addicts went. It's not like this big thing where NYU students hang out now. It was very different. Huh. What has it meant to you to provide, you know, uh, being an ASL interpreter, to providing that, you know, necessary form of communication? Well, I mean, it's... Uh, I, I enjoy it very much. I mean, it's not something I had planned to go into either, but it's been amazing. It's given me a great life doing both of those together because they work very well together, the writing and the interpreting. And I never thought I would ever write anything about. The book is not only about a deaf blind guy, it's also about his his gay sign language interpreter and you know how those two worlds kind of come together and like help each other. Uh, and I mean, it's a, something I've experienced over and over in my years being a sign language interpreter is that, you know, connection with people you wouldn't normally be connected with and how that's just such a great opening up experience. Uh, and you get to be living all these different lives as an interpreter. I mean, I've done everything from interpret in dog grooming school to lying on the floor of a surgery interpreting to a person who was getting spinal surgery and I'm on my back on the floor interpreting to them. Uh, yeah. Wow. So you have a lot of really crazy and wonderful experiences. Um, yeah. So it's, it's been great. Uh, yeah. I've loved it. Wow. That, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's interesting us who um, don't uh, know ASL um, or are not deaf, don't really understand the situations where you have, you know, you come to be a gift to, to help those folks. Yeah, I mean, it's the right. <laughs> oh, I, I, I wouldn't call yeah, it a yeah. gift. I would call no, it, no, but it the right I mean, to have a sign language interpreter. Yeah, but, it, yeah. but it is that you're, the, I mean, you're there be, being able to help them communicate and understand what is happening. Like, in, you know, talking about being in, in a hospital, got to be a scary situation just yeah, in a nor I mean, normal just interesting <laughs> yeah. i mean I'm, I'm like i'm someone that's always liked kind of uh you know strange situations so it's like it <laughs> kind of just like matched my personality that's um yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think it's, I always like, be careful about that because it, I'm not like, oh, I'm a helper. They pay me. And it's right. their right by the law to have an interpreter. And the book gets into that a lot because like so often deaf people still go into situations and like the doctor will be like, hey, can you get your mom to come and help you? I don't want to pay for an interpreter. It's like, no, by law, you need to provide an interpreter. And for lots of reasons, luckily, we're living in a time for the deaf person where, one, they have the ADA law to protect them, but also in just making a phone call, uh, the government provides a service where they can have an interpreter on the phone. So, like, if you were a deaf, young deaf guy and you have an STD, you don't really want your mom to come and interpret for you with the doctor. Um, <laughs> like, can you imagine that all the times? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. so awful but uh yeah anyway so i just wow. want to make sure that it's not like oh i'm mr helper uh, they're, they're so paying me i'm providing I, service but it, it is a, a you know well-deserved you know service that they de definitely absolutely be entitled to for sure um we, you know when our mutual friend Vinny posted about your new book he said that it was a lifelong dream of yours to publish a novel where did that dream begin for you? I, again, it wasn't a lifelong dream because I didn't think I could write a novel. I, I had been a playwright. I had written for television, the, that other stuff. And then when I moved back to New York, I didn't know. I had done a couple other plays. And I'm like, I'm not sure what I'm going to write. I didn't even. It's not a light lifelong dream to publish a novel it's a lifelong thing that i've admired but i didn't mm. think i could do it and then i just started writing these short kind of sketches of people on the subway and and i would post them and people really liked them and then one new year's i'm like i gotta get more dedicated to this new form of writing i'm doing you know because you know so many writers say oh i'm gonna write and they don't and I'm like, well, I need to put some habits in place. So I vowed to apply for an MFA program. I didn't have to go to it. I just had to apply to it and join a writer's group. And I'm really good at following through on my promises to myself. So I did those two things. And the writing group I joined, uh, we meet every week and 
can bring 10 pages of stuff we've written. And I just started bringing 10 pages of stuff. And I had this idea for a book that turned into this book. And I also got into the MFA program. And so I just started writing this like, okay, what is this story? What's it going to be? Like when I write a story, there's this thing in writing called a pantser versus a planner. I am definitely a pantser. I start writing something and then the characters just tell me what it's going to be. I might write an outline, but the characters are like, fuck you. And then they just take it any way they want to go. And that turned into this, although this was 800 pages because, again, I didn't know. It ended up being about two books worth of thing. But I'm like, well, no one's going to publish it anyway. Then it won this award in school. And then I, it was my thesis for my MFA program. But I... My MFA took seven years because I went just one class a semester. And in that time, I actually wrote two books. This was my thesis. And then I wrote a second book, uh, which I'm now like trying to shrink down right now. The one about uh, Fire Island in 1989. And uh, during COVID, like you created the show, I was like, what the hell do I do with this manuscript? Does it suck? You know, it probably sucks, but I should get some professional <laughs> advice on it so i contacted a friend who's a successful novelist i said do you know anyone that will even look at this and tell me if it's shit or not and he's like my agent will read it he'll read anything and so i sent it to his agent who i didn't know is a phenomenal agent named doug stewart who represented cloud atlas american dirt silver lining playbook so i sent it to him oh, wow. first agent i sent it to and a week and a half later he called and said can you talk tomorrow and this was in uh, May of 2020, uh, he gave me some suggestions to rework, which I did for the next two months. And then he sent it out and he sold it at auction. Um, so it was amazing. But I didn't really have a lifelong dream to do this. Mm -hmm. It was a lifelong dream to be a working writer, which I've had at different parts of my life. But I never even dreamed I could write a novel or that anyone would read it. Um, and it turns out I can and they do. And I'm very happy. So. That's awesome. And, and, you know, getting great reviews. So you should be. And, and, and this was in your, your mind for how long, the, the, the sign for home? Well, the, the book itself, it, what happened was I, <laughs> I hooked up with some deaf guy and he ended up being like an actor. And well, yeah, he was an actor. And I thought, well, It'd be, there needs to be more plays with deaf characters. And I had been a playwright and I had this little idea and I started writing. I'm like, oh, this isn't a play. This is a book. And so I just, that was what happened was just, again, the form itself decided what it was going to be. I'm like, but I don't know how to write a novel. And the stuff on the page said, well, guess what? You need to write a novel. So shut up and just do what you're told. And that's what it, what it started. So uh yeah that's how it began also with an interest in i mean i work with the deaf blind as well and one thing that's different because there's a few books out this year thank goodness that deal with deaf characters but my book specifically and mostly deals with the deaf blind character which is something that hasn't really been explored very much almost not at all in literature or film there was a short film last year that was nominated for an academy award about a deaf blind guy uh but this is probably the first love story where the main character is deaf blind and it's such an interesting uh way of being uh deaf blind and i i became very curious about like a deaf blind friend of mine help had me help him with his dating profile and because he with the the kind of deaf blindness like the character in the book has and he has it's this thing called usher syndrome where uh they're born with like night vision loss and then they lose their peripheral vision and then it, it, it you know they can see through a spot that big and then maybe even that becomes blurry so they're, they're born with sight and then they lose their sight and i was my friend who was help i was helping with his dating site because he couldn't look at the interface on the app you know i was just curious about what he will you know once he's lost his vision what he's attracted to because as like a vain gay man i've always been attracted to the sound of a voice or the look of a face and he explained about how it's the touch and feel of a body the smell of the breath you know the content of what the person is saying and that was hmm. interesting to me and so i interviewed all these deaf blind people about what they cared about what were the political issues they cared about how they fell in love who 
they fell in love with and kind of built this character. And then the, the interpreting character is, you know, loosely based on me. Uh, but it's not a, it's not a, a true story. It's invented. I, I can't take the stories, you know, from the clients I work with, but right. I gathered the emotions from the interviews I did and their goals and stuff and kind of built this character of Arlo Dilly. And um, then just, you know, what happens when he, you know, when his Jehovah's Witness family, he discovers is lying to him. And he has this new friend who's an agnostic gay man who's interpreting the truth to him. What happens when those two get together and go on this journey to find out what happened to the girl that this young man had lost? And that's that's what the book is about. I, l I love all of that. I mean, first of all, I love the research that went into this. I mean, that's just, you know, I'm sure is what brings you know, as you were saying, some of your friends who read it, you know, called you crying, you know, brings the emotion to it because you you really had the emotion from those other stories. So you understood. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen again, this isn't a story about any in true living person, but these experiences having, you know, nurses that will assume uh, a deaf person, oh, they can read fine. So I could just write to them. Do you really know that? There's a lot about, uh, there's amazing deaf and deaf blind writers in the world. Uh, deaf, a great deaf blind writer that has a book of poems and then a book of essays coming out, I know, who I love, who's one of the informants on this book. John Lee Clark is brilliant, and I really recommend everyone read him. And there's amazing uh, deaf writers like Sarah Novick, who has her book True Biz out right now. But there's also a, a huge portion of the deaf population whose hearing parents didn't give them a language, didn't sign to them when their deaf child was born. And so for the first several years of their life, they didn't have a language at all. And it's called language deprivation. So they struggle with acquiring other languages. You know, once they learn ASL, like then they finally have a language, but it's very late. And so it makes it, makes it more difficult for them to learn other languages as well, such as English. And and that's the case of the character in the book, which is why he takes the English class in school. But with a lot of clients I work with, they'll have this atypical language, this atypical English, and their professors will assume, oh, there's something wrong with them. You know, they're stupid or, sorry, I was adjusting my monitor to get rid of the glare on my lens. Um, they'll assume they're, they're like, they're not smart because their English will be a little bit wonky. It's like, no. You know, they're just as smart, probably smarter than anyone in this class, but English isn't their first language. ASL is, and they never have heard English. And you see these injustices happening as an interpreter because we're interpreters were always like between both worlds, the hearing world and the deaf world. And so we see this stuff happening. And this book is a bit of, oh, what it is for me as an interpreter to see these things and kind of like, okay, let's look at this look what's happening and to the hearing world. And you guys need to look at this and stop acting like assholes. Um, anyway, that's my, uh, I love thing. it. What, what do you hope readers take away from Arlo Dilly and, and the story you tell? Well, I mean, hopefully first and foremost, it's, it's a good read. It's, it's an enjoyable story of friendship and a love story between Arlo and this character named Shri. I mean, first I want them to enjoy it, but what, pretty much every writer comes away with is they not only enjoyed it, they also know so much more about a world that they knew nothing about, which the vast majority of the country knows nothing about. Because, you know, for a deaf blind person, you know, you have to have these interpreters, but it's also like even deaf people that talk to them will need uh, to kind of get through to them in a way that they're not used to. So there's a lot of isolation in that world, but there's so many incredible, incredible people who are deaf blind. And I'm, I'm hoping the book inspires people to reach out and find ways to connect with the deaf blind people, as well as deaf people, but primarily with deaf blind people who have not been, you know, paid attention to or looked at uh, by our country. And I, and that's happening. And that really is extremely gratifying. It should be. I mean, the fact that we're in 2022 and you're saying, you know, this is one of the first books that deals, you know, with this community is, 
surprising, really. I mean, other than Helen Keller and and the album Tommy, who is mostly just like kind of fetishizing and using it as a metaphor, not Helen Keller, but the Tommy kind of thing, it's it's really hard to because it requires the hearing sighted world to reach out and say, okay, what's going on with an interpreter, an interpreter that does tactile sign language. Uh, but things are changing. Uh, deafblind people are, you know, there's several great deafblind activists that are out there trying to make a difference, like Divya Goel, who is one of the people who is an informant for the book, who I would, uh, you know, ask, like, what's the most important thing for the hearing sighted world to know that the deafblind community wants them to know. And a lot is about providing access. That's our society's disability, not their disability. We need mm -hmm. to provide the access for these people. It's their right, by law, it's their right to have access and we need to be willing to, to give them that access. And then we have access to, we as hearing sighted people have access to these worlds that will just make us so much better if we allow them into our world. Incredible. Incredible. Before I let you go, what can you tell us about your, your second book that you're, um, you're, edit, you're editing down now? <laughs> well, it's, it's the working title right now is uh, Disco Witches of Fire Island. Uh, <laughs> good. I'm glad it makes you laugh. It's, it's yeah. both funny and serious, like most of my stuff. Yeah, this book, as you can tell from the color, cover, is a lot of serious stuff, but it's also a love story and you know, there's a lot of humor in it because I, I don't write anything without humor uh, because life, no matter how dark, is also hilarious. Uh, but the other book is about uh, Fire Island in 1989. It was before I got there, but I had been a bar bartender on Fire Island. And I wanted to write kind of a memoir mixed into this kind of fun fantasy world where this young bartender moves into the attic of these older gay men who end up being these this coven of disco witches. And so it mixes, oh, what is it to be a bartender in 1989 on Fire Island where all the people want to have sex with you, but they don't want to date you because you're a worker. So there's a, there's a lot about the class system on Fire Island, but then there's this whole other magical realm that's working there. And what is it also to be a young man growing up in the time of AIDS when there was no cocktail, there was no cure? And what did that mean about dating and existence back then? It was something that I wanted to share. You know, being someone that, you know, came out right when AIDS was coming up, you know, it was yeah, a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> it was awful. It was th that was all I thought about. You know, when we're supposed to be thinking about our hair, we're thinking <laughs> about if this person we're kissing is going to die. You know, and and so it's about all of that, plus disco, plus witches, plus a love story. It's kind of tales of the city meets, you know, something magical, more magical, uh, and mythic in a way. So that's. Hopefully, you know, my agent will go out with that soon and it will sell. I love it. Blair, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Come back when the, the next book comes out. I would love to. Have a great day. You too. Thank you so much to Blair Feld for being here. Please pick up a copy of Blair's new book, The Sign for Home, today, where all books are sold. Veronica Moya's new book, How to Elope in New York City, is packed with resources to help couples who have chosen to go down the micro wedding route in New York City. Veronica gives tips on how to hire high end and expensive vendors at a discounted rate. This new fascinating guide reflects the author's natural insight and abundant wisdom and experience in organizing thousands of unforgettable weddings in the Big Apple. She has infused her vast experience as a micro wedding expert in writing and curating this how-to guide. Over the last five years, Veronica has not only become a veteran in the wedding industry, but also a dominant leader in elopement style weddings in New York City, which has continued to grow even in the face of the pandemic. After founding the city's fastest growing elopement company, Wedding Packages New York City, and the first ever Vegas style wedding chapel on Manhattan's Upper West Side, 
Love Chapel NYC alongside her husband, which has received international acclaim by the likes of Fox News, NBC, The New York Post, Business Insider, and many more. It's my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Veronica Moya. Hey, Veronica. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you. I'm very excited that you're here with me today too. And I was so interested when I was reading about you. At 17 years old, you founded a kids entertainment company in one of my favorite places, Buenos Aires. Um, tell us about the company and how you got started at such a young age. The, oh, that company. Isn't that funny when you look back in your life and you're like, wait, so I guess I had enough for this back. You know, you, I didn't even know what I was doing. I guess I just wanted to make money. So, yeah. So um, back in the day, there was no Internet. There was nothing. So what I did, we used to, you know, make actually handmade signs and you post them in the um, in the grocery stores in the neighborhoods. Right. So what happens, like, you know, someone sees it, they call you, the first one calls you, and then it became massive. And I'm not exaggerating. I know everybody likes to, you know, blow their own horn. But the truth is, at the time, I, I, I don't know if you know, but Shusha was very popular back in the day. She was, um, she's a supermodel from Brazil, and she did children's shows. She did, you know, she was a children, um, she had a children's show. And she was very okay. popular. She was very pretty. And so, and I was always a performer. I've been acting since I was four years old. So I'm like, you know, everybody loves Shusha. So I used to have, I used to put this long, um, you know, dress kind of like her with, with the boots and, and the pom-poms and the songs. And then um, I got help from grown-ups that, that work with kids and they helped me create um, activities for them to do and games and we had a little tunnel that they go through and then we did like face painting anyway the thing is so obviously you start slow you start wherever you are right you know where you're at is where you're at and then it just grew and I had to actually hire um you know dub, hire, hire people my classmates so we started with the, just the two of us my best friend then we had other girls because there's some, sometimes we were booked the same day for multiple parties. So, yeah, that was my first. I never thought of, you know, of anything, you know. Of, but um, we did really good. Yeah. We did really well. That was the last year of high school. Um, and it's funny because after that, I went and I got a job at McDonald's. Because, again, you know, we loved America so much. And McDonald's was <laughs> a big. Yeah, well, it's very different over yeah. there. You know, like, it was it was a whole thing, you know, they had this training program and it was very, it was like a club, like a little, you know, all your friends work there. And, uh, and that was great experience too. So I have a lot of, you know, throughout the years uh, between performing. So I, I was always doing acting and singing on, you know, on the side, it wasn't a full-time job, unfortunately. And then, yeah. um, so very ambitious at a young, very ambitious <laughs> at a young age. Yes, I guess so. Yeah, but then I don't know. Yeah, then, sure. then we stopped. You know how things are. Then my, my classmates, they went on to the university and doing other things. And then, and actually, I came here to study English for a year. And that's how my love for New York uh, started. And then, you know. That's what I, I was going to ask you. It, it, is um, coming here to learn English what brought you to the United States? Yes. So originally, that's, that's why I came, to learn English. And then, of course, I'm a performer and I love musical theater. And back home at the time, there was no musical theater culture. It was very, it was very, very niche. And there was nothing. There was no way of, there was no, no, you couldn't go, you couldn't take classes for musical theater. So that was a perfect excuse um, for me to, oh, I had to be in New York. I have to go there and, and try it. And so... I, I got into an exchange program and I was taking classes. I went to the uh, HBA. Oh my God. HB Studios. HB Studio. Yeah, HB Studios. Okay. Everywhere. I went everywhere. Uh, I worked with Miriam Fawn, Woody. Um, I worked with nice. a company in New York City, in New, in New Jersey, a very talented duo of. Um, 
son and mother. He's a very good composer and they did children's shows. So I, you know, I was the green fairy in the, I mean, I had small roles because even now you can see I have an accent. So back in the day, a few years back, I, my accent, I, I bet it was even worse. So, <laughs> you know, I was limited here, but yeah. I had a great time. And then one day I discover wedding officiating, which it doesn't exist back home. We don't have officiants in Argentina. There's no, you cannot do that. You either go to the, I mean, you have to go to the court to get married. And then if you are religious, then you'll go to a church or a, a rabbi, a, you know. Right, temple. Like I, didn't temple. I didn't realize I didn't realize that. My best friend is from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. No way, no kidding. Oh, yes, well, you've got mm -hmm. Aston. Yes, yes. Yeah, I didn't realize no, that. It doesn't exist. So when I, re when I learned that this was a job, I said, oh, my God, I'll be great at it. You know, I, I don't <laughs> mind. You know, I like speaking. I like performing, speaking in front of people. I love people. I like, so I yeah. looked into it. And like, you know, like everything in life when it's meant to be, you know, it just snowball. It just became bigger and bigger. Before I knew it, I quit my job that I had. I was a manager for, a, a, um, I used to work in the health club industry. And... Mm -hmm. What do you call it when you're in restaurants? The hospitality industry. Yeah. So yep. I had a lot of experience managing and, uh, you know, doing payroll and, and, you know, talking to employees. So once again, you know, then, you, you, you know, when you look back in your life, you realize, oh, OK, so I guess everything was pretty organic. And the, yeah, the office. Yeah. Were you were you officiating before you became a coach? Oh, no. I'm, I've been a so I said no coaching was since 2003 I started okay. officiating in 2008 and uh and the thing is that the wedding the wedding business just took over Alan and uh I don't know I mean I, there's no much I can say oh, honestly it has been for me and especially these past two years it's funny that you said with the pandemic we we really thrive you know what's the past tense of thrive but we th we thrive but yeah. we, we yeah, had a, yeah. yeah we had the best years the last two years and so what happens is which is amazing yes but it's because <laughs> because we specialize in you know central park weddings and micro weddings mm -hmm. small ones. so everybody yeah. that's all they could do right they couldn't yeah. have the the traditional wedding so yeah you know there was no brainer they came to us and so to be honest with you, you know, I miss it. I'm, 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 I'm working now on getting back to my coaching. I don't know if you know, I teach children how to meditate yeah. and how to develop yeah. their. Yes. I love that. I just, and I love well, children. That's what I was, that's what I was going to ask. Your, your main focus is kids and you believe in training the mind and spirit towards self-awareness and personal growth. Why do you believe that is so important for the younger generation? Well, that is key for success in life. And nobody emphasizes that when you are learning, when you're in school. So when you're a young person, you're young, you're a child, all you hear is no, 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 sit up straight, go there, do, you know, and yeah. you, you, you get your analytical mind super trained, right? You learn how to add and divide and multiply, and now they do code and you do, and everything is the, the big mind and a little mind, you know, strategic constantly. But it seems like everybody has agreed to ignore the fact that only through your intuition and your sixth sense is that you can really thrive in life and go places. And that means mm -hmm. getting out of your own way, putting the ego aside, it's a training like anything else. You know, you have to train that part of your mind that we all have. You know it. You're an artist. To every mm -hmm. artist anybody who ever won an Oscar or, or, or has done a terrific work would seem work. Like I remember I used to experience this when I was acting, uh, the way you connect with the other person, the way you connect with the actor. This is not from, you're not thinking, thinking, oh, let me make this face. Let me, no, you don't. You, you, you're a terrible actor if you did that. The only way to do that is to be present, to be grounded, and to connect, to connect at a different level. And that, that 
that knowing, that technique, you can take to all aspects of life. So then when you are trying to pick a school or decide what career to go for or who to hang out with or who to date or who to hire if you have, if you have a company, if you're a CEO, yeah. I mean, you must, I'm sure, you know, casting directors, I always, many times when I, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a TV fan, I watch everything and, um, and I, Me too. Always, I always admire the casting. It's like, wow. Wow, that and they're the most unsung heroes of you know any any production. Yeah, that's, that's, abs, abs, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I want to continue and talk about wedding packages, New York City. You founded this in two thousand and fifteen. What prompted you? Yes. to open. Right. So we, I, I did this at the end of two thousand fifteen, after uh, officiating weddings for almost like ten years. Oh, I started in 2008. So no. Okay. <laughs> you know. Seven years. But still, Seven years, yeah, yes. That's a long time. Well, almost uh, 10 years. <laughs> almost 10 years. But like I, everything in my life, you know, the tr and this is what I like to impart. This is why I like to teach those classes because my success in life, I only credited my ability to get out of my own way and let things happen and just go with the flow. So on that note, what happened is that I learned as I was doing the officiating, I started learning what people wanted and what they needed. And then I started giving it to them, right? You learn, like, you know, you get all these calls, you know, people call for information and, oh, it's mm -hmm. just the two of us. Oh, it's just my family. Oh, it's small. Oh, it's in our backyard. Oh, we're going to my friend's house. And I learned that was code for we don't want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> so... <laughs> So slowly I said, okay, what do you need? What you definitely need for a wedding is two things. The most, the, the, main, the main two services that you need is the wedding officiant, the person to make it legal to marry you, and mm -hmm. photos. You always want photos, right? So my first packages started back in like 2010, um, and I just had a photographer. So it was me and a photographer. And then I started offering um, a little bouquet, and I used to make the bouquets myself. Wow. This, imagine. I mean, just because I wanted to keep it cheap and I want to save yeah, money. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, you know, you grow and learn. And then, of course, you know, one thing led to the other. And then I, I realized that there's a real need for this. It was a niche. You know, wedding, wedding packages in New York City. Um, focusing specifically in people that want to elope or they want to have a destination wedding. New York City is an amazing city. I don't know why everybody goes to Vegas to get married. Here we have, you know, the Centr Central Park is, well, I don't have to tell you, it's gorgeous. You, 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 you do, right, you don't have to tell me. And I'm fascinated about Love Chapel NYC because did anything like that exist here in New York City before you and your husband started it? No, it doesn't, and it still doesn't. So we are the only one, and that's all him. So that was his dream for many years. While I was doing the weddings in Central Park, he always wanted to have a, spa a place, a chapel. And again, all we, we're always thinking about Las Vegas and say, why can't we, yeah. why can New York City? Because it's super easy to get married here. You get your license today, you can get married tomorrow. You only wait one day. So, um, it, so I, 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 it really is surprising, though, when you think about it, right? right. The most beautiful, the largest city in the world, that that didn't exist. So yep. kudos to, to him yep. and to you yep. for doing that. So that, too, came out of need. He's a headshot photographer, corporate headshot photographer. So with the pandemic, he lost his job. And he's also a wedding officiant. He's a minute. He's an interfaith minister, but uh, he lost that job, and now you know he's sitting around. And he's like, "Well, this it was a perfect storm. It was a perfect time. The rent prices went down for commercial spaces, so everything worked out. He got you know we found this beautiful space a block away from Central Park because you know I love the park and I think it's great for photos." So, you know, we've been there, There's truly, Veronica, there is nothing better for photos, yeah. especially wedding photos. Yes. So, yeah, we've done nothing really, better. really well. The chapel is busy every day. We have had days with 16 weddings, you know, we start at 9 a.m. and blah, 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 blah. 
and it's uh, economical, it's simple, it's easy, and it's pretty. You know, you get to sit, especially still. Can you believe that City Hall still is, is giving you a hard time to go there and get married? You need to make an appointment. And when you make an appointment with City Hall, you can only bring one person with you. That's it. Wow. Uh, and then wow, you go wow, through wow. the metal detectors. I'm like, who wants to do that? So, you know, um, my goal is always to make things easier for people to facilitate. So that's how my company was born and the church, the, the chapel was born. Oh, yeah, the church. the I'm chapel. Sorry. The chapel. No, that's I okay. Mean, that's okay. No religion. And, and, and that was a perfect segue into writing this book, I would assume, How to Elope in New York City. It was just released. What prompted you to put it all down on paper? Uh, the billions of questions that we get every day. So after, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and it's always the same, the same, the same, the same questions. Everybody wonders the same things. And between that, so the book is a, a, a true guide for a New York City wedding, whether it's big or small. I specialize in small weddings, but it's useful for anybody. So even if you're having a big wedding, um, it's useful because it helps you think of things that you, you didn't think about before, things that you can ask your vendors the way you should approach mm -hmm. them, what you should consider when hiring a wedding planner. Many, many things that fall through the cracks many times that people don't think about until it happens. And then it is your wedding day and it's way too late to do anything about it. So um, I give a lot of advice based on my own personal experience because we had a hilarious wedding in Central Park six years ago and we Did made you? every mistake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every mistake, uh, everything that I tell you not to do, we did it. And, uh, <laughs> but, but that's great. So it makes for great storytelling. And, and, and we only learn by those mistakes. Yes. I learn it yeah. the hard way. And this is why. <laughs> no, but seriously, this is why I, I urge people. I mean, the book is, is an easy read. It's like, I think you can read in an hour. And um it's helpful it, and you can feel my desire to be of service and to help you avoid the mistakes that I made oh, here's my, that, that I made <laughs> and then because it's too late, you know, when it, it's already, it, it happened already. And I A thought absolutely. I was doing everything right. So yes. It, um, is there, is there one tip that always surprises couples most? Well, okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna pull my husband. Okay, so my husband also wrote a book called How to Officiate Your Friend's Wedding and Not Screw It Up. His book, it doesn't have the bestseller thing, but let me tell you, it is a, it's a, he's making $300 a month selling that book. How many, you know, the, his royalty is like $4 a book. So do the math, how many are sold each month? A lot, many wow. books, that means, that means a lot of people are, ha are having their friends or family members officiate their wedding. Yeah. One of the tips I give you in my book is don't do it. Don't have a friend officiate your wedding. You should have a professional. And I explain why. And the reason number, the number one reason is because relationships change. And this happens so many times. It is so sad. Uh, people... I don't know, they fight, they, they, they have a mm. falling out, even with family members. And then you will have this person there, you know, in every photo, every video of your wedding. So that's the first reason. And there's many other reasons. So that's my personal pet peeve. Do not okay. employ your friends for your wedding, even for photography. And, and I, exp I, I go into detail um, in the book and, I hope I am persuasive. I can I can paint a very good picture of why. Well, even if you're... You, no, we all we all have friends that are good photographers and they want to take photos, and that's great. You can let them take the photos, but please do yourself a favor and hire someone, hire a real photographer that is working for you, that you can boss around <laughs> and you can tell them what to do. You want to have that, and you don't want to do that to friends because it creates tension. They are anxious, they are nervous, um, emotions run high, and they want to please you, and you put them in a difficult mm -hmm. position. Yeah, well, that's my take on it. Okay, I, I, right. I love that. <laughs> I, one, one last thing before I let you go. 
congratulations on being named uh, one of the top 10 entrepreneurs to watch out for in 2021. Thank you. That, that, bravo. What, what drives you, Veronica? What motivates you? Motivate, I'm a fixer. I like to fix things. That's what drives me. Something is wrong to, and I'm like, I can't take it. You know, my husband has to hold me back. When I go, when I show up for my weddings, you know, I, I start doing everyone's job, you know, because I have, I have staff, I have a team of people that are doing, you know, whatever they're doing. I'm like, no, no, move that. Put that over there. I'll make sure, you know. And this is why I think I didn't work out as an actress. Because you, can, you cannot have this person out. You cannot tell the director how it goes. Yeah, I have a funny story about that, but that's for another I, day. I love that. Thank you so much for stopping by today. If Thank you, you are for considering, having me. You are so welcome. If you are considering eloping in New York City or know someone who is, please pick up Veronica's new book, Where All Books Are Sold. Veronica, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Alan. My pleasure. Awesome. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Special needs, addiction, divorce, righteous grandmas, overwhelmed parents, one kid in the closet and another on the road as a showgirl. How can it all be happening in the same family? There's only one sure bet things will get worse before they get better. Join young Warren Barnes for a bumpy ride through the 1970s and 80s in a sweet, heartfelt, and funny story that will make you laugh until you cry. It's all part of That Which Makes You Stronger, a fictionalized memoir written by Greg Triggs. Greg is an author, a former performer, and a show director for Disney. In 2003, he joined the ABC Daytime Writers Development Program and has been a producer for Super Soap Weekend. He is the owner of Strategic Entertainment with clients that include Disney, the Tri Tribeca Film Festival, which is coming up in June, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, and he also co-produces Broadway's next hit musical. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Greg Triggs. Hey, Greg. Thank you, Alan. You're so welcome. Thanks for being here. I'm super excited. I was doing interviews a couple of days ago, and I mentioned I was going to be out of the locker room, and one of the interviewers just gushed. He was so excited. He's uh, he's a fan of the show, so this is very exciting. Oh, that's awesome. Who Do you know is, who, who that was? Uh, Dwayne from the Orlando Sentinel, Dwayne Bevel. Wow. Wow, that's the first. I appreciate that. Thanks. So I understand you grew up watching As the World Turns with your mom and your sister. Uh, we were, were addicted. <laughs> there is even a uh, there is even a Kim and Dan joke in my book. Uh, one of my sisters was blind and kind of isolated, consequently. And so she would have these conversations with people where she would be talking about soap operas as though they were happening in her life. So she'd be like, oh, my gosh, you guys, my friends, Kim and Dan, they're in love. But Kim has amnesia. And you would just watch people fall for it. It was wonderful. That that reminds me, I, I love telling this story. Carol Burnett was a huge All My Children fan. And she would go on vacation before DVRs. And she would have friends of her call the hotel in like Monte Carlo and leave messages for what happened on All My Children. And they would be sort of, you know, just like you were talking about Kim and Dan, like she would get phone calls that Erica, you know, had a miscarriage. This one got divorced. <laughs> and My the hotel is Carol Burnett of Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> so there. That, were there other soaps you watched growing up? Uh, Guiding Light. Um, and uh, so we were a Procter and Gamble, Gamble family. My mom, yeah. you know as time progressed, became in all my children uh, and uh, young and restless. She went through phases with those, but as the world turns was, you know, the, the core family, we were probably really Snyder's, but we aspired to be Hughes. So. <laughs> I love that. What, what were your initial, um, you know, career ambitions as a young kid? Did you know what you wanted to do? I knew I wanted to be in a creative job and I knew that words mattered to me a lot. And mm -hmm. so my grandmother, as evidenced in that, which makes us stronger, gave me acting lessons when my parents were having a lot of marital problems that were, you know, obviously affecting everyone. I think she thought it would be an outlet for emotion 
to kind of be safely expressed. And so I discovered performing. And so as a, as a kid, I did a lot of community theater into school shows and that type of thing. And then I decided I wanted to be a director. And so I studied directing until I was, you know, I got my undergrad with a directing focus. And then the day after graduation, I realized no one was going to hire a 22 year old show director. So I had to figure out how to kick open the door with different companies. And I decided that would be through performing improvisation. And so I did a lot of improvisational comedy in Minneapolis at the Brave New Workshop, where I think I learned the fundamentals of storytelling through my point of view. And then Disney came to a show and offered me a job and I worked for them for 12 years as a performer, but about eight years in, I transitioned to writing and show directing and producing, which is how Super Soap Weekend became part of my life. So were you working in Orlando? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, always, I always aspired to live in New York City where I live now. So when Disney bought ABC, I thought, oh, that is the ticket for building a bridge from Orlando to New York City. So I was lucky enough to start getting assigned to a lot of the promotional things that kind of combined the Disney brand with ABC. And so I worked on the Super Bowl when ABC and Disney did it. I worked on a lot of promotional summer programs, but my favorite was Super Soap Weekend. Those fans were everyone's favorite. That was just everyone's favorite weekend at Walt Disney World. It was a very smart thing ABC did. I, you know, ha having worked on the Procter and Gamble soaps, I wish it was something, you know, we we had done. Um, but it was a very smart, synergistic thing for Disney to do with with their four shows. Oh my gosh! And. I think the loyalty it created with the fans for Disney and the soaps. I have a wonderful story that kind of ties to the book, or I think it's a wonderful story. Uh, I was co-hosting the Linda Dano talk show at Super Soap Weekend, and we were warming up the crowd before uh, Linda came out, and we were playing a game asking who, who had been following the soaps the longest. And so one, one frail older woman who I'm guessing was in her late eighties had her hand up for 60 years and the crowd kind of went wild. And I interviewed her and she explained that she had been following them since they were on the radio and the crowd went crazy for her. And we segued out of that moment. And I said, thank you very much. And she grabbed my hand and said, thank you. And I looked at her and she said, you don't understand. I am in my late 80s and nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I've never had an experience like that in front of an audience. Thank you so much. And when I tell that story, it's not that I was part of it because I think that could have happened with any aware host. Right. But, but I think this I think my book is full of people like that. People who deserve attention for the lives they've lived but often don't get it. And so one of my goals with this book was to give a voice to people like that and specifically women with whom I grew up. Mm. I, I love that. What years were you in at Disney in Orlando? Cause I worked for From Disney. 1990 to early 2013. I started out oh. as a performer in a show that was at the time called street Mosphere. And then became the citizens of Hollywood. And then I moved over to Pleasure Island, which is where I really oh, yeah, wanted yeah. to be. So I was yeah, one of the I actors at the Island. Adventurers Club, uh, playing Emil Bleehaw and Dashing Hathaway Brown. And then I moved to my dream job with Disney, which was definitely performing short form improvisation at the Comedy Warehouse. That, that's amazing. I worked for Disney in New York in the movie division, and we came down there quite often to do we did the beauty and the beast premiere there and we did it an aladdin premiere uh at oh, that's Dis so cool Di at disney mgm studios in 2003 you were involved in the abc daytime writers program how did that uh enter your world well um i was always looking for that bridge uh to um get me to new york and soap opera writing was very attractive to me because i thought well i certainly won't age out of that and um, I can do it from anywhere. And as evidenced in my book, I have two siblings with special needs that definitely, you know, means I have to be able to get home. 
And I thought, so if, if there are crises that, that affect me needing to be home, I'd be able to do that wherever I was. So do you know Sue Johnson? I rem- yeah, I remember Sue Johnson. Yeah, Sue Johnson is was and is the best. She is an amazing, thoughtful, smart advocate for people. And so she got me into the writer's program. And um, Millie Taggart was my mentor. Um, love, and love then Millie. Tom Cassiello and Sherry Carpenter uh, became my writing partners uh, after we left the so uh, the, the daytime writers development program, uh, all three of us went on to have different relationships with ABC daytime, but we also wrote projects together in the hopes of selling something to television writing scripts, which helped, I think all three of us grow as writers, but certainly as friends. I love the two of them so much. What was Sue Johnson's title? I'm wondering if it's the same Sue Johnson, because it must be. I think she was the director of talent development or something like that. I don't remember her exact title. She was originally from Wisconsin, blonde woman. She went on to write for the One Life to Live reboot that they tried. Oh, interesting. You know, there might have been somebody at WABC with the same name. That's funny, though, because I do know the name, but I didn't think she was involved in the daytime world. Really interesting. Tell us where the idea uh, stemmed from for that which makes us stronger. Um, I have a a very unique family. I am, I I grew up thinking I was one of six children and then found out about some other people out there. And, um, my parents had gone to high school together. They married other people, uh, and they found their ways together in in their late thirties. And they had my youngest brother and I, uh, as I mentioned before, two of my siblings are challenged. Uh, My father had pretty severe addiction issues a good guy smart kind talented generous but he was a dad addict as i call him in the book a dad with addiction issues and then it it, it happens sadly to the best of them yeah and and it's no reflection on the family you know um but i was lucky enough to have uh, my oldest brother art who was an amazing guy and he helped raise me. And so this book is kind of a shout out to that kind of brotherhood, the brotherhood that I kind of think of as grout, you know, the, the stuff that fills in the spaces in between and is Mm -hmm. kind of always keeps it together. Exactly. Exactly. So my brother's middle name should have been grout. Uh, and, (laughs) um, Everything, I, I would honestly say almost everything I value about myself, he somehow set in motion. You know, mm. I'm just, I'm so thankful to him. And again, he's one of those people who, you know, probably lived a quieter life, but I think those are certainly worthy of attention. And unfortunately, Art passed away pretty young and I think one of my primary motivations for the book was to thank you was to uh, tell stories that his children could get to know a more accurate representation of my brother. And whenever I talk about this, Alan, it sounds so heavy, but the book is actually funny. Uh, The, the, the banner on top of the book says a funny novel about serious things. So I try to bring humor to situations that, Um, sometimes in writing are presented rather one-dimensionally. And I like to think that I show the people who are dealing with those things in a more three-dimensional way. My father isn't just an addict in the book. Um, My blind sister isn't just blind. They are more than the words that would be used to describe them. to describe them yeah, yeah yeah and you know humor is often used to help us get through difficult times stories yes moments. so and i like to think that um the strength i like to remind people through this book that when you're going through something, you're going to get on the other side of it and you're probably going to be stronger for having gone through it. And where you are is not where you're always going to be, nor will you live there. 
you can learn from it and build a more intentional life that, you know, takes mm -hmm. you away from those things. So, you know, I, I described this, uh, the book as a fictionalized memoir, you know, when you're putting this together, what was it like looking back on all of those aspects of your life? Well, another quick, funny story. When I was in college, uh, I took a writing class and I wrote a story about my family. And the professor wrote at the top of it, uh, this is a beautifully written story, but it's unrealistic. There is no way all this could happen to one family. And he tried to give me a lower grade and he made my parents call him to tell him that all this had happened to one group of people. And so I think I've spent, I, I don't think I could have written this book 10 years ago because I was still deprogramming myself to a certain extent or getting on the other side of it all. And so- Learning from it all. Yeah, exactly. Setting the lessons in motion. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons I call it a fictionalized memoir is- you know, I think it's about two thirds real experience and one third where might the story have gone. Uh, and I did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, there were just certain things that I didn't want to relive the drudgery of. And then there were certain things that I moved to a slightly different era of our family life because that was the that was where the book was. And then the the last thing that I wanted was. I didn't want my brothers and sisters, all of whom I love very much, obviously. I, I didn't want them to get caught up in the, Greg said the curtains were red and white. They were blue and white. Or Greg said that, you know, this person said that. That's right. not how I remembered it. So I wanted them to see what, what our family had gone through, but not in forensic detail and not in a way that presumed that stories that were not mine to tell were being told. So I tried to create a little distance um, respectfully and mm -hmm. um, I hope kindly, you know, I think a lot of times when people write about their lives, it can be with a bit of a grudge and who wants to be that guy? You know, the, the world is heavy enough. You know, one of the things I loved about my mom is, and that I said in her obituary is there's no doubt the world is a better place for her having been here. And so, you know, I don't think we all get to, you know, solve or, or solve an international crisis, right? But we can all do small things to make the world lighter and better. And again, those are the kind of people I'm trying to celebrate in this book. That's awesome. That's awesome. You you published your first novel, The Next Happiest Place on Earth, in twenty March of twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like holding that in your hands for the first time? Oh my gosh, Alan! Anyone out there who is thinking about writing a book, quit quit <laughs> living in the world of maybe and give yourself the gift of having done it. You know. Um, I, I, I know with... somebody who I hope is listening right now. So good. She, she knows up... who she is. <laughs> write a book, Alan's friend, write that book. <laughs> yeah. um, it, you know, I don't, where did you grow up, Alan? New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay. So you were, you were closer to the centers of greatness than I was in Wisconsin. Um, uh, I was very lucky to, I mean, really, you know, I, the career I've had would not have happened if not for the location I believe I was in because it really, you know, I, I got very lucky. Somebody overheard me say I wanted to get into the entertainment business and she worked in human resources at ABC, sort of like oh. this, the Sue Johnson story. Daphne Bow uh, is a woman who worked in human resources and said, we have a page program at ABC and literally that page program changed the course of my life. You see, so. I think that's such an important lesson. Things, things that you want, you have to be willing to verbalize and mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to get out in the world. I think that's one of the tenets of improvisation that's really helped affect my life. But I grew up thinking, oh my gosh, you know, my mom had Jacqueline, Suzanne and Mishner, people like that all over her bookshelves. And I just thought, oh, those, they're breathing rare air that I will never get to. 
And then a wonderful friend of mine named Lorna Landvik actually published her first book. And it kind, my head kind of exploded because I thought, oh my goodness, actually, normal people can write a book. And so when I left Disney in 2003, I thought, I'm going to go crazy waiting for the phone to ring. I'm going to try to write a book in between projects. And so that's what I did. And it took about eight years. And then it took a couple of years of editing and challenging my point of view and strengthening the story and finding out how I could get it out in the world. But I did. And my goal for my first book was just to feel good about getting it done, uh, to develop a point of view and see how people responded to it, to see how it might grow and to create a bigger opportunity and the motivation to write a second book. And luckily, all of that happened. I'm now with Red Hawk Publications, uh, redhawkpublications.com. They're a wonderful company that supports emerging writers. They've already published one of my best friends, Mary Joseph Peel. She's, she's the next book in their queue. And, you know, awesome. opportunity creates its own momentum, I think. And um, I love people that. have certainly... Well yeah, people have done yeah. that for me. I, I want to do that for others. I, I love that. Eight years seems to be the theme here. Uh, the first author I had on, Blair Fell, the book he just published took eight years. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting. But you're so right about verbalizing. I mean, because not only was I not verbalizing it to Daphne, I was verbalizing it to someone else who was asking me that question. Daphne just heard it. So it's, you know, when, if I didn't when say I it left out loud. Disney. When I left Disney, I really, I gave them a year's notice and I promised myself every day I was going to do something towards my goal of getting to New York City where I'd fallen in love with my now husband. And um, I remembered one of the lessons of improvisation from my show director, Chris Oyen at Disney, who said, energy doesn't die. It takes other forms. And so when you put something out in the world, you don't know what the world is going to turn it into. And that's certainly the case with books, right? Like you read, you read the reviews for the next happiest place on earth. And, and I was like, oh, I, I think they're right. That theme was there, but I didn't consciously do that. Yeah, and I think one of the gifts, I, I bet you feel that way about this show, Alan, that one of the gifts is seeing what the world turns something that you have approached with a pure intention what else the world can turn that into and it's oh it's, i know yeah yeah it's very yeah. exciting and it was such a joy i mean i wrote this book during the pandemic and as an old all my children or all my children and general hospital when i was in the abc daytime program and certainly the cbs soaps as the world turns a guiding light when you answered for me what happened to some of those people or you just saw, I think of Catherine Hayes and Eileen Fulton a lot with this, that, that what they did mattered and that it still exists in the world and that what they were passionate about, they are remembered for. And to see them both doing so well during your interviews, it made me so happy. And I, I really appreciate you in my own small way, allowing me to be part of that community because it, it meant a lot to me, you know? Thank you. Yeah, I, I knew it would mean something in the sense of seeing familiar faces, especially when I started it at the beginning when we were all so disconnected from Ugh. everything in the world. Um, but I didn't, you know, I don't think, I, and it wasn't, I d just didn't, you know, it wasn't a thought process that, hey, I'm going to host a show. It was, I just wanted to try to do something to take away from me watching the news and cheer people up. And mm -hmm. the result of, you know, hearing that, you know, makes it really um, the best decision I probably have ever made to start this show, you know. Oh, that's so thank you. Well, thank there's you so much to be that. proud of. And, Thank you, you know, Senator. people that I've been curious about since I worked with them, you know, it, it's just been so I used to I always mispronounce her name. I never remember if it's Alicia or Alicia, but Me Minshew. Mm -hmm. uh, we were neighbors in New York City. So ah. when I was getting my scripts for the development program, she, her, it was next to her scripts on the mail counter. 
uh, for all my children. One day she just knocked on my door and was like, who else is getting scripts from ABC Daytime? And and then we ended up working together on Super Soap. You know, there's so much synergy and uh, opportunity for zeitgeist in the world that mm -hmm. um, you just kind of have to slow down sometimes and be aware of or be open to. Um, I always think, and I say it about my mom toward the end of the book, is that she she taught me not to worry about what you can't do, move towards possibilities. And that, that, is, that has served me well. That is, I, I don't need to end on anything else. That is a great ending, except I do want to know, is there another book in, in your head? Yes. Um, I was originally thinking I was going to go back and write a sequel or a prequel to The Next Happiest Place on Earth, but... I've got to say the immediacy of a story that you've lived an aspect of is too, too beguiling and sexy to ignore. So my, uh, my goal for uh, that, which makes us stronger, is for it to inspire another book in the same world and uh, further okay. explore uh, how... Warren gets to the finish line, how we overcome some of the, the, the family issues or the issues he's creating for him own, his own self, right? His own self. Is that correct? Is that good English? Um, yeah, for himself. Yes, for himself. And for um, I'm excited to do it. And That's so I, I really, anyone who's watching this that picks up the book, please also leave a review on any online platform, including Amazon and Goodreads. Um, it's my goal for the fact that I've written this second book to matter enough to inspire a third, because no matter how much self-help and work you do on yourself, once a Midwestern codependent, always a Midwestern <laughs> Greg, it is such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for reaching out. I'm so glad we did this. Congratulations on that, which makes us stronger, which is available where all books are sold. You, you're very welcome. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody for watching today. Like I said, all three books, uh, Blair Fell's book, Veronica Moyer and Greg Triggs, are available where all books are sold. I hope you'll pick them up and take uh, and read them, <laughs> not take, read them, please. Um, please join me tomorrow when actress and former Charlie's Angel, Cheryl Ladd joins me live for an audio interview live here in the locker room. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. You can turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows and feel free uh, to check out my new website, thelockerroom.com, if you have some time. I hope you all have a great evening, and I'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Bye, everybody.